I'm delighted that we have an all-star panel to share uh, their experiences with philanthropy. So to my immediate right is Tom Toomey, president of UDR, incoming chair of ULI Americas, and chair-elect of the uh, Oregon State University Foundation. Next is Lizanne Galbraith of Galbraith and Company, a member of the ULI Americas Executive Committee and chair of the Fairfield County Community Foundation. And last but not least is Len Forkus, president and founder of Milestone Communications and founder of HopeCam, which connects homebound kids with cancer to their classmates via the webcam. So our goal is to have a lively and candid conversation about the leadership roles each of you have played and continue to play, and hopefully will do even more on behalf of important nonprofit organizations and causes. Um, this topic really resonates with me. Um, social responsibility is part of my DNA. Uh, I grew up in Washington, D.C. during the Vietnam War, so it stayed with me for, throughout my career. Um, I've always been involved in the nonprofit sector uh, by participating on boards, and at what point chaired the board of a social services agency in New York City. I feel blessed at this point in my career to be using my real estate development skills to run a nonprofit that is at the intersection of arts and real estate. Uh, my organization uses arts to catalyze economic development in underserved communities. So with that as a kickoff, um, as with all ULI panels, um, we want to leave you with practical takeaways, and we expect you to ask lots of questions at the end. So I'm going to start with Len, um, and we're looking forward to hearing about your organization, how you got involved, and take it, take it away from there. So um, I'm just going to stand for just a few minutes. So um, I started a charity called Hope Cam uh, after I learned my son Matt was diagnosed with leukemia when he was in the third grade. He was nine years old. I wrote a book about uh, the story uh, of a bike race that I did uh, that I'd like to share with you. Uh, it, started, it started in 2002 when my nine-year-old son was diagnosed with leukemia. And at the toughest time of my son's life, when he needed his friends the most, he was stuck at home going through treatment. For, for kids with cancer, they have to purposefully suppress their immune system so the chemotherapy will work. And when I came home after work, I could see how lonely it was for my son to be isolated. And for kids with cancer, it feels like the whole world is moving forward and they're stuck in neutral. They feel like they've been abandoned. And as a dad, I wanted to do anything that I could to help him. So in 2002, before Skype was invented or FaceTime, we figured out a way to put a web camera in his classroom and one in our home. And we connected him with his friends. And those 24 kids in his third grade class reminded him that that empty chair in that classroom, that was his desk, that was his chair, and they wanted him back. When his hair fell out from the from methotrexate, the drug they give, his friends could see that, and they helped him get through it. And when he went back to school in September, it was so magical, because we had demystified cancer for those 24 kids in the classroom. And that's when I knew I had to do something to help other kids have the same feeling. So we started a charity, and we called it Hope Cam. And to pay for it, I started running ultra marathons and get, I got my friends to support me. I ran a 50 mile ultra marathon, it took me 10 hours. I did that race seven different times, each time I raised more and more money. I started doing Ironman triathlons, I did five Ironman triathlons. Each time I did an Ironman, I raised more money, we bought more laptops, more tablets, and we helped more kids. And then in 2012, I qualified for a bike race called Race Across America. Now, real quick, Race Across America has been going on for over 30 years. It starts in San Diego, and it finishes in Annapolis, Maryland. And you have to do this race in 12 days. The Tour de France is roughly 2,000 miles. Those guys get 24 days. So you have to ride 1,000 miles longer than the Tour de France in roughly half the time. And uh, I was successful in doing it. I had a crew of 11 people that supported me. Uh, we went across this is the van that was behind me 24-7. Uh, we went across the deserts. We went across the Rocky Mountains. We went across the Great Plains of Kansas. And during that time, I had 11 positive, unselfish, highly skilled people on my team to support me in doing this. And when it was all over, we raised over $350,000. And with that money, we were helping roughly 50 kids a year, mostly in the Washington, D.C. area. And with that money, we partnered with St. Jude's. 
and we, we increased our volume to 250 kids a year. And there's only two reasons you're at St. Jude Hospital. Either you're in a clinical trial where nothing is working for you, or you have no money. And 70% of the kids that Hope Camp connects today are go to Title I schools where they subsidize most of the lunches. And these are kids whose parents can't afford internet. We've got only over 120 Wi-Fi hotspots out there right now connecting these children. And, uh, and I realized that uh, by, by helping more children, by, by sharing the, spreading the word, I wrote a book about it, I give speeches, I give talks. Tom's company has hired me several times to give a leadership talk to his team, but I've raised over $300,000 giving book talks, uh, supporting the charity. I'm this chief storyteller for Hope Cam, and, uh, and it's been a wonderful thing. But the problem is this, 10,000 kids get cancer every year, and we need to help more kids. And so I've signed up for this bike race again, I'm doing it on June 13th, and my goal is to raise a million dollars. And so far I've raised over almost 700,000 of a million. And I tell you, it's one of the hardest things I've ever, ever done. Because, let's face it, I'm very uncomfortable. I put myself in a very uncomfortable position. But I learned one thing. When you set a big goal, you have to ask for help. And you have to ask everyone you know to support you. And you have to be humble. And you have to be vulnerable. And I've learned that uh, I'm not asking for myself. I'm asking for these children. And so on June 13th, I'm doing this bike race again. And, uh, and our goal is to help 500 kids a year and to continue to grow the charity and, uh, and to create more impact. And uh, this is a picture of my son, Matt. He's 24 years old. Uh, he is uh, working in the apartment industry. He works for Mill Creek. He leases apartments. Uh, he's cancer free and he's moved out of my basement. So with that. <laughs> That's the most important. Most important part. So. <laughs> um, well, thank you for taking time out of what I'm sure is a really rigorous training schedule no. to be with us. It, uh, I, I was saying to Len earlier, my husband about 15 years ago decided to ride across the country solo, but just on his own, uh, without the support team. But he, he was doing 100 plus miles a day, which I thought was pretty impressive. He made it two thirds away across the country and came back and kind of looked like Gumby with these big shoulders. <laughs> His goal is to someday finish the rest, but it's a, to, to do it in the time frame that you do is, is really inspiring. Um, and I, I know having checked out the website, you should all do it too. There's plenty of opportunities for people to, to contribute to what's a really worthy cause. Do you have, so does you have other fundraisers during the year? Is yeah. This yeah, we have a 5K every year, which we're doing actually on Sunday. And we have a dinner, and we have, also, and we have other uh, athletes also that uh, run marathons and do other things. And we, we build web pages for them so they can raise money as well. So, so how did you build the organization and build the board? Well, it's like, it's like anything. You start, you start small, and you start with your friends and people that know you and uh, can see the impact and uh, have been touched by uh, you know, what, what happened on my family. And, uh, and then over time, you, know, you just create momentum. And, but again, you have, to be, uh, you have to be dedicated to asking for help. And, uh, and people want to help. I mean, people want to support you. You just have to be able to prove to them that the resources that they're giving, whether it's time or, or capital or other forms of resources, that you're putting them to good use and you're a good steward. Just like in my business, I own my own company and my investors want to see results. And so I've got to show results and, and we've got to show impact. And, and it's storytelling because people are moved by the stories of how these lives, of the lives of these children have been changed and how they've felt less depressed and have felt more connected. And, uh, and so that's the key, is you have to keep beating the drum, asking for support, and continuing to show the impact. So Lizanne, let's turn to you. Wow. <laughs> that's not fair. No, I'm, <laughs> Your I know you're up Your bicycle is out back. Well, yeah. You can start <laughs> I'd love to talk, but I gotta go ride. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one of the questions that Wendy asked is, you know, how did you start in philanthropy, and, and what motivates you? And, What's been your journey? And I've always used uh, the phrase in so many ways is more is caught than taught. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I think I came into philanthropy really because my family, my grandfather and my dad, and I grew up with it. So it wasn't, it, it was just part of life and an assumption that you give when you're in a position, you give back. And um, so when my children were younger, using the same philosophy. We, um, again, to try to carry on the tradition, 
we gave when our kids were like, I think eight and 10, we gave each of them, third one wasn't around yet, um, 500 $1 bills. And we made them count it out. And we said, we, you can give this to any place you want to give it. And we went through a very thoughtful, deliberate education. You can give it all to one place. You can give it to a huge organization. You could give it to United Way. You could give it to the Red Cross. You could give it to your, you know, your third grade class who's trying to get uniforms for the team. So it was, it was a very deliberate effort to teach them about philanthropy and, and also what's important to you. Because philanthropy, I think, is a lot about your own passion. Because if you're not passionate about it, then it will wear out. It's just a lot of work. And if you don't have the passion, then it, will, um, it won't be sustainable. So we gave the money to them, and they went online and did their research. And I must admit it wasn't successful in the sense that we went through the process. And we, what we, the lesson learned was philanthropy is not just about money. It's about time. It's easy to give away money, and for some, which is why we made them count out the $100 bills to, so that they could really understand that value. But then they donated it, and then the next year when we went through the process again, <clears throat> there was really no follow-up in the organization or how, what happened to the money. Did you make a difference? So then we realized you really, it's about giving your time, too. So I've kind of used that in my, as I've gone through, um, again, more is caught than taught, and I wanted my kids to see that, in fact, I am philanthropic and I don't just talk about it. For me, what resonates more is local. So um, where I, I can see, it, there's so many needs in, in the world, um, but I wanted to show my kids that the needs in Africa, there's equally as desperate needs in our backyard. And so I got involved in specific charities locally. And then in an effort to leverage time and talent and treasure, as they say, became involved in our community foundation, which is called Fairfield County Community Foundation. And it's an interesting, um, Fairfield County, for those who don't know, is um, southern Connecticut. We're about 50 miles outside of New York City. And it covers 23 towns. And it starts with Greenwich, which is maybe one of the wealthiest communities in the country. And the western or eastern side is Bridgeport, which I think has the largest opportunity gap in the country. So the challenge is, how do you get people from Greenwich to care about people from Bridgeport? So it's, that's, I've gotten very involved, started um, from a friend who said, you know, will you get involved? And I said no about three times. Then I finally said, uncle, OK. And then, realized my, because I didn't really know the space, um, what I could bring to the organization was governance, um, was learning how to put together committees and bylaws and accountability and how do you do budgets and how do you accountable to budgets and how do you do results-based accountability, which is what a lot of philanthropy is now. Donors, especially sophisticated ones, want to see, they don't want to just write the check, but now they want to see the results. So there's a whole thing called RBA, which is all based around that. And one of the things we do is we train not-for-profits in Fairfield County. So I thought, you know, this is a great way for me, given my abilities and time, um, to leverage helping others. And so I am now chairing the board and focusing on the pillars that we do. And some are, you know, drill down very deep to actual not-for-profits in the area, and you know, everything from homeless shelters to education to, um, we have one, one effort that actually trains other not-for-profits. So we do meetings where all the board chairs come or the CFOs come. And I thought, what a great way to leverage. I'm not helping just one not-for-profit, but I, I'm, hopefully this organization is lifting the water and the tide for all of them. Um, and, and then I take my kids to, you know, again, still thinking they have to feel it and touch it. So we go to, every once in a while, we'll go to a not-for-profit into a soup kitchen or a, so that they actually see. And, you know, these are five miles from, from where they live. Um, so that's how I've kind of tried to leverage um, 
and, and teach at the same time. Tom? Well, I, I think first let me start by thanking you for coming to ULI. I know you, there's many things you could have done, but ULI is a great community to be a part of, and by being here, you're contributing to that. Your dues contribute to a lot to the success of ULI and what it does on a charitable and changes the lives of a lot of communities that we operate in, so thank you. On a personal level, thinking about it, I go back to, I was raised as a Catholic, and, and think about the early years of just giving back through what I'll call the pan. And, and then when we had children, it was a little bit more focused around our children and the schools that they were going to and how we could see the advancement. And then later in life, you, I really started to bring some focus to this on a personal level and say, what am I passionate about? Where do I believe I can have an impact? And when you start answering those questions, it's all of a sudden there are thousands of opportunities out there, but you narrow down to the question of, am I going to give time or give money? Okay, Because you only have so much of each, but where is the allocation going to go? And, and, and how do you think about the trade-offs of each? And, and along the way, I'm very passionate about education and children in the end. And then it falls into, well, people that I really believe in is what I started really identifying and realizing that in many cases there was organizations that were doing an outstanding job and I really believed in the people. So those were my premises as an individual. And, and what I found is this. Um, in the case of Oregon State, where I'll soon be the chair of the foundation, it, it's a real simple case that State funding for education on a higher university level is coming down across the country. And in particular, in the state of Oregon, at one time it was 70%. And this is for an institution that's been around for 150 years. It was 70% was from the state. Today, it's 7%. How do we fill the gap? And, and we now have an extraordinary foundation. We have a staff. And we raise 100 to $150 million a year for scholarships, professorships, buildings, and we're filling that gap. And, and that is only going to grow in America. All our higher educational institutions are challenged by the state support systems that are being weaned away. And, and what was my connection? Besides going to there and being an alumni, um, I look back at my life and realize very abrupt moments where someone had an impact. And in this case, it was a professor uh, in accounting, and she just took me under her wing and said, this is what you need to do. And later in life, I've always kept up with her, but I asked her what, what would touch her, what would make her legacy important. She said the following, went to the university, and I said, well, here's my check, I'm ready to go. And you started getting involved, and you realize the gap, the opportunity, and the impact of leveraging how many different lives you could impact. Um, so that's my Oregon State. Along the way, there's a lot of other things from animal shelters to schools to other things where I believe in the people running them. And it's just easier to hand a check over. I think there's a different, which we started off with lessons learned, which is many of you are running companies. How do you instill and what are the parameters and I see too many companies where the CEO says, hey, this is where we're going. I have 1,300 people, 20 different communities, 20 different markets. And, and what we've tried to instill there is we're going to give you time off. And in fact, everybody gets three days. You as a participant in your community can decide how you want to spend your time. And you can also make a pitch to us if you want us to contribute as a company to better our relationship with the community and make you a better connection along that line. So we don't have a corporate program. What we have is 1,300 people can ask for and receive. And, and Glenn came to our uh, offices at one time, made a great Pete speech and presentation, and it was inspiring. And, and we said, guys, how much money do you think we should give? And, and that's the way to build philanthropy inside your company. It's not telling them what to do, 
but offering time and a say in where the money goes. And, and I think every company, that's how you take my role, but I may now empower 1,300 people that work with me on how they bridge the gap and the leverage you create there. And it is about the leverage you create. It's not just solely a time or a dollar, but it's the impact of the things that you do that matter. Well, you're leading by example, which is terrific. Um, I would love to, now I know in, in, in my case that when I found an organization that I was passionate about, um, and it was always, um, it's always time and money. It's, uh, you can just give money, but if you want to give, if you actually want to be in a leadership role, it's time and money. And um, I don't know, I always feel as though I go, I get drafted onto the board, I actually attend the meetings, I pay attention, and before I know it, I'm being tapped for one thing after another. <laughs> in the instance of the social services agency, um, I was uh, very successful in recruiting a terrific executive director who basically said, I'll take the job, but you have to promise to be the chair of the board. And I thought, okay, we'll do this for a couple of years, and then we'll get her comfortable. And then after about nine years, I said, you've got to release me. So um, I'd love to hear from your experiences on you know, how, how you became involved on a leadership level. Um, because I think uh, you don't, most people don't just jettison in. They work their way up. And how can they contribute? In particular, um, I have found that one of um, the best things that I can do on behalf of an organization is bring um, my business skills and strategic visioning. Um, every nonprofit has its own story, but m many of them, particularly ones that come, have a social services background, um, historically, it's the person who is the executive director is somebody who worked his or her way up from social work. Wonderful people. Financial skills, not so much. Um, and organizations grow and helping them figure out how to grow. So I would love for you to share some of your experiences on this. Um, I think it's a realistic assessment of what you bring to the table. And I, th I think if you start, um, I'll use ULI for an example. You know, you come to ULI um, as an associate member, and you know it takes you a couple years to figure out where the bathroom is, and then you realize because you found mentors or you found friendships or you found like-minded people that um, you learn to navigate where you, where what's important and where you want to spend your time, and it, the, you know when you're starting off, it's you're taking. You know, you're learning, you're getting things from an organization. Um, and then, you know, as in ULI, for example, you go, th you go through the process and you figure out, is this a place where I want to spend my time? And ULI, ULI is unique in that it, it both gives and takes. So you spend a, a, lot, a large part of your beginning of your career taking and learning from product councils and, and district councils and um, organiz people and, th and programs within the organization. And then you kind of get to a point where it's like, a, you know, I've gotten so much from this organization that I want to give back. But you can, you're at a place to give back because you've spent so much time in the organization and you have developed a passion for it. Um, and then, you know, you find a place where your skills and talents and, um, can make a difference. And, but I think you, by starting at the beginning and going to um, coming as member, as an associate and then becoming a member, you learn the DNA and you learn the passion and you learn the mission and you learn the values. And if it resonates and you're in a position, then you can give back. Sounds like a, a great um, infomercial for getting people involved in leadership at ULI. Well, I also think the more you give to something, the more you jump in, the more you'll get back. I mean, I, th I think um, in any organization, you know, Oregon or Community Foundation or, you know, the efforts to cure cancer and to help 
um, those afflicted, you know, I mean, talk about passion, <laughs> you know, and that and he's that because he's totally passionate about it and has found his skill set in his place where he can make a difference. Kind of turning the hourglass differently. I mean, you've built a board, you've built an organization, and what's worked and what's not. Well, I think that uh, you, like anything, you start you start small, and uh, you, you be strategic about it. Um, uh, what I what I discovered was my friends would pay me to suffer, <laughs> <laughs> and with the money. There's something a little weird about that. I know, <laughs> but but they would pay. So the more that I pushed myself, I learned that the more the more I became uncomfortable, the more I grew, and and for some reason I was able to recruit other folks that would come with me. And, and uh, they saw the mission. It was so super simple. It was so clear. And, uh, and I think it's really just uh, trying to find kindred spirits, just like, like through a lie. I mean, look, you know, the, you know what's interesting? Is uh, the day that I learned my son was, was diagnosed was the, the day that uh, I was supposed to interview for the job as the district council chair for Washington, D.C. I had volunteered for ULI for seven years, doing all sorts of different things for the, for the district council. And, uh, and I literally, I'm not kidding, I, I actually called um, David Mehta and said, I can't come to this interview, and I'll explain later why. And, uh, and three weeks later, uh, I said, yes, I'll do it, because I knew that uh, I needed something that would also help me stay busy. But, uh, but I think that all the things I've learned in terms of building teams and, and recruiting folks to volunteer, I learned from you a lot. Because if you find people that are like you, that want to give back, I think, I believe in this life, there are givers and there are takers. Yeah. And ULI is filled with givers. <laughs> and uh, a lot of ULI members are my first board members, too, because they have that common core. So that's, that's kind of how it kind of got started. And then we kind of, you know, we kind of stumbled on this upward spiral where we'd push harder, gain more people, move more impact. It kind of spiraled up. And we kept, you know, taking on big, big bets, and it's paid off. To me, I think it always, like anything you enter in life, you kind of look at it and say, first and foremost, what's the ask? What do they need? And where are the parameters around that? And then, do you like the people that you're around? And, and in my case, um, it was simply, hey, I'm fulfilling an obligation in one role. But I can think of other food bank efforts and things where the person and the cause draw you, but you all of a sudden start making connections with people who are like-minded, much like ULI, other things. And, and so if you're open to that, and, and then how you advance into the leadership role is that it's your passion takes over. I mean, all of you are very successful. And you ask what happened to that success? Well, it was a few breaks and a lot of passion. And, and I found that over the years. I didn't start out at, at ULI with any vision of saying, well, you're going to be a global chair. <laughs> no. I started out with I really like the people, I like the cause, and you just spend more and more time on it, and it takes over to where you say, I can really help. I can make a difference. And, and I think that's often where we think about what we're trying to accomplish. And then I would also very cautious, and, and there's some caution around these things. Don't get trapped into things you're not passionate about. Because you have a lot of skills, and a lot of people who want to use those skills. Just be careful. To that light, I also think one of the hardest things is to say no. So when people come and ask for um, your time or your resources, um, and again, the need there is so huge, but it's, it's the ability to be very disciplined in how you want to spend time, certainly, which is such a limited resource. Um, and to be honest with yourself, because if you're not passionate about it, and if it's just because a friend asks, there's always a way to say, you know, I can't do it, let me help you here, but keep it very confined. Um, but I, I think that that, for me, has, always, has been a very hard discipline. But you know, what's really great about that, though, is knowing yourself and knowing what you're good at and knowing where you can have impact. And so when people make requests and it doesn't necessarily line up with what you right. think you can have impact. I'll give you an example. 
I started a business uh, by partnering with schools and municipalities. Uh, I, I, I'm a real estate developer, but I also have a business where I build and own wireless cell towers. And I had partnered with a number of schools. So when Matt got sick, I knew exactly who to call. And I knew how they think. Uh, because that was my business. I was able to use the skills that I had learned in my business to be able to do this one thing. And no one had ever done that before. No one had ever asked to put a web camera in a classroom. We had to plow through legal issues and consent issues. And let's face it, schools don't work very quickly. And I knew that. But I had to work so hard. It took, it, it took six weeks. It felt like six years. For them, it felt like six days. Yeah, I, mean, for, you know, I mean, it was like, but, we, but, I, but I, had that, I knew how to do that. And so I was able to match up something that I had some experience with. And I think that's where you have to be thoughtful about, does, right. does this request really line up with what I can, where I can have impact? This question doesn't apply to you because your organization is so, so much a part of the fabric of who you are. And, but for those of us who get involved in organizations that um, we're passionate about but don't have quite the same you know, personal connection, how do you know when it's time to move on and get involved in another organization? Um, I, I, there's, a, there's an interesting t tension between um, be becoming deeply enmeshed, um, having uh, continuity, being able to provide, to really understand things in context. At the same time, um, I think all organizations need some fresh blood. Well, I, I think in one case, what I enjoy greatly about Oregon State is we have a sunset. Okay, it's 12 years. At that time, you are rolling off the board because we have so many other people we want to continue to bring on. And, and so you can always look at it and say, and, and there's some people that get the full 12 years and some that don't. But we're always looking at inside the room the contribution element of not just the financial aspect, but their engagement. What else do they do when they have free time? How much are they engaged to the advancement and the influence? And, and so in a, in a professional board like that, um, it's nice to have that sunset. And, and other charities I've been involved with, the challenge is, is on a personal level or any other level, it's when does your passion fade for it? And, and how do you know that's fade? And it's when you ask yourself, boy, am I fired up about going? Or does it feel like an appointment on my calendar that I have to go to? And it's just a personal element. You'll know. And, and I think I would be very, my advice to you would be, be very transparent about it. Don't get mad. Just say, you know, I'll give you one more year, but it's time. And, and help them find the next person. The key is, is always finding somebody better than you. It makes it easier. Keep going. Yeah. Keep going while they're well, I also oh, think okay. one of the, I certainly as a board chair, um, one of, or in governance, or, uh, you know, one of our roles is succession, um, whether it's on a corporate board or a not for profit board. Um, so I, I think if you do your job really well, it, it will be time for you to leave because you've got, you want to motivate and, and bring up um, new eyes, fresh eyes, new perspectives, and new talents. So I think it's a, it's Don't a responsibility. Don't you find that when there's a sunset, people really pick up the place, pace because they know they only have so much yeah. time? And then you say, I really want to get a lot accomplished in that window of time. So it, it's interesting to me the dynamic of, of sunsetting or not and refreshing. And, and if you're upfront about it and say, it's not through perpetuity, but a lot of the people make the mistake of, well, they're just on it. How many years have they been on it? 25 years. Well, how many things have they contributed in the last five years versus the first five? It's generally a curve going down. So I, I think it's a challenge, but it's transparency around the subject always gives you a breath of togetherness. Because you want everybody to be on the same page on these darn things, and they're challenging. So um, is my mic? Yes, it's working. OK. Um, being involved with nonprofits was very important to me all through my career. And one of the challenges, particularly when my children were younger, was how do I balance being a full-time professional, being a good parent, and still giving back in other ways. Um, 
I'm married to a great guy, and he felt the same way, and so we juggled, um, and we made it work, and it was a priority. Um, I'd love to hear, you know, as your kids were growing up, you know, how you balanced that. I, um, it wasn't, I, as it turns out, we didn't preach at home, we just did it. And um, I'm proud to say that all three of my kids have become very involved as, as young adults and now, as, uh, now that we're empty nesters, now that they're more or less on their own. Um, and it's not because we talked about it, it's just they saw that we did it. And I think Morris that that's a big piece of, of what I think is, I hope will be my legacy, is having led by example. More is caught than taught. Yeah. But how did you deal with the challenges of work and everything else? Well, I think there's an element in, in my life that I look at and say, I didn't do it right. Growing up, um, raising my kids, I was a 100-hour work week workaholic, and well, I just didn't do it right. And, and so one of the things I've, uh, and I've been running a public company for 25 years, running my own businesses for almost 30 now, and what I came to the conclusion was on a cultural basis, you need to set the tone. And partly I live in Colorado, which that helps setting the tone. <laughs> Because if you ask Everybody somebody to work a 100 hour a week, they walk out the door. 55 hours a week is even tough. 40, this job is 40. So it helps to adapt to the culture. And our culture is really simply this. Your choices in life start with the balance between work and life. And if they're both not in sync and going well, it's not gonna go well for you. You can't have one being over the other. And in that context, you start with, what does it take to succeed on both of those? Time. So they're in a pendulum. They're always tussling. Open culture, open work hours. You solve your own time element. After that, if you want to choose where you spend your time, okay, it has to come from one of the others. You need to go talk to somebody and make that work. So just trying to be very transparent about that toggle and, and trying to instill that. Now, when it comes out to the charitable piece, that's why we settled on this model of saying, we'll pay for three days of your time to go do it, and we'd like you to do it as a group. So if it's a community, and I run the apartment business, of 10 people in one city, one community, why don't you do it together? And one of the other communities to cover you for that day, but build it around a team, and why don't you guys agree on what the thing is you wanna do? But give you, th and, and for those others, if you want to give money, that's great, but you still get the three days. Go do something with that to build your own community, your own team. And I, I like that story about what Lynn's talking about, about building a team and going and accomplishing something really important. And that's why we've had him so many times present to people, is it fits our culture. And a lot of you leading your companies, you talk about culture, but this should be the part of that conversation about how you want them, and let them choose. That's uh, just my view of it. I can add to that. Um, I think, uh, well, first of all, you can't, I could never do the things that I'm doing in helping to run the charity and, and also you know, doing these athletic events if I didn't have tremendous support amongst my teammates in my company. I have 16 people on my, on my company. And uh, everybody is uh, you know, a self-starter. Everyone owns their work. And it gives me the freedom to be able to go out and ride a bike for two weeks. Uh, and. Uh, but at home, I remember um, three weeks before I did the race in 2012, my daughter, she was 15 at the time, and she pulled me over and said, Dad, I need to talk to you. She sat me down she said, you know, Dad, I know you're doing this bike race for a good reason, and I know it's to help kids, but I gotta tell you, as a parent, you've been checked out. I mean, you used to cook pancakes for me and my girlfriends after sleepovers, you're out riding your bike. There were times I needed help with my homework at night, you're asleep on the couch. I mean, Dad, I love you, but really, as a parent? And wow. I mean, well, the first thing after, you know, took the, heart, the knife out of my heart, <laughs> the first thing I thought was, wow, how cool is that that my daughter can actually say that to me and have the confidence? And I told her, I said, you know, Vienna, I said, Vienna, you're right. I mean, I, you deserve better. And uh, this race is gonna be over soon. And uh, I don't know how, but I'm gonna find a way to make it up to you. 
And so for five years, I've been cooking a lot of pancakes. <laughs> <laughs> Doing a lot of homework. A lot of homework. But there's payback. And you have to know when you can push and when you can't. And you have to balance those stress points and when you can contribute. And so I think you've got to look at the context of all your relationships. Well, I'm, I know she's really proud of you. And my guess is she probably looks back on it now and says, why did I even say that? He's working so hard. I mean, some of that is also adolescence. Yeah. Um, you know, I found that through my participation on boards that I actually honed my professional skills. And I would love to hear um, if any of you had the same experience. No. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's just the opposite. It's very challenging to recognize in charities or education institutions that the pace of change is not your business pace that in many respects, the people that are there are about their cause, and you're trying to introduce, hey, it's about the bottom line, it's about the money we raise, it's about the impact we have. And you forget that, or there's regulations, or there's transparency, there's public get, weighing in on what you're doing and why it's a good thing or bad thing. And, and so it's broadened me out. It taught me more than I could ever teach them about the sensitivities of pace, cause-driven organizations operating in a nonprofit world with a volunteer orientation. Sound familiar? It's called ULI. Okay. But what happens is, is then it switches the gear from, gosh, I could do it now, to wait a minute, look at the leverage of all these people giving their time and effort. How do I get them pointed in the right direction and the multiplier of it? And it changes your management style to a more conducive, community-driven cause. And that's different than running a business. And I think that is one of the things I probably got back more than I've ever given. I could tell them how to run a damn business and make money, but I could never connect to pace, leverage, cause-driven. And, and so that's what I've gotten back. And it's been a hell of an education. I mean, if you want to go to a state university and say, you know, why don't we build that building? And you go, yeah, well, we can raise the money. We have it. Yeah. Well, why can't we do it now? Oh, we've got to go to the state. We've got to do this. We've got to do this. It's on the five-year plan to start. What? I build a building every day. So it's been fun. You've had none of that. Yeah. Um. I think my resistance to getting on the foundation, getting involved in the foundation to begin with, was the whole frustration of dealing with not-for-profits. Um, and it, it uh, I find I have to check every meeting I go in and, and find the patients and find the, because um, I, I find it frustrating. And I, you know, to we'll sit around it even in a, in a at a board meeting, and you'll sit around and you'll all agree this is the direction, this is the strategy, these are the tactics, this is how we're going to do it. And then, you know, two weeks later, six of the people who were supposed to make phone calls didn't make them. And um, someone who was supposed to follow through on a specific task, or, oh, you know, I got busy and my company this, and I, oh, I forgot. And, and I mean, you don't have any leverage, you know. It, it, it's the uh, challenges of a volunteer. And, and um, it, it takes. Uh, you know, it, it just, it is what it is. And, and so what I've tried to bring to this board in particular is, is structure and process. Um, and um, again, the whole RB results-based accountability, not only for the not-for-profits, but for our own organization. Um, and it's, uh, it, it's frustrating. It's, it's just a different pace than a corporate board. I, I must say from my experience, um, not, not everybody is a born leader of a board, and having the right board chair really sets the tone in terms of making sure that it's that there are measurable goals and that you stick to the plan and that people are held accountable. Um, it, that it's that time is a precious resource, and you want to take advantage, make the most out of everything, and. Um, I think with a larger organization, such as your foundation, I'm sure the pro process is 
a little more formal, but with many other organizations, um, it's sometimes you. Um, what do you, you think really makes a changing? good chair of a board of volunteers? That's a great question. Um, patience, motivation, contacts. We've known some great chairmen yes. in our lives. Extraordinary. Um, good listeners. Very good listeners. Um, yeah. and, and people who have exude the confidence and the um, wisdom, and the wisdom, and you know, you're, we've got mutual friends that you know I would follow over, over the cliff um, because I believed in them as people, um, and they they were good listeners. They have compassion, um, and and you know, a skill set. Yeah, I I would agree. I mean, there's been several past chairmen of ULI that have been on my boards or people I've done business with, and. And I was always struck by a handful of extraordinary skills. They, um, their presence, uh, their ability to listen, and their ability to draw out everybody else in the room. So when you're recruiting a board, you think about how you're going to manage that person. They might be very withdrawn, but have an amazing intellect. And you know you have to reach in and pull them into the conversation. But when they contribute, you're going to get a lot of wisdom. And, and so they're very smart at listening and drawing other people into the conversation. They're not about leading. You lead by bringing a community of people together and get them to interact. And then it's a question of how you move through your decision matrix. But if no contribution is made by everyone in the room, then you know there's some voices that disagree. And, and so I've watched very good chairmen run and recruit people that they know how to pull them out. So if you're building a board, you build a board because of their passion for you and your cause, but you already know how to manage them. You know, I've built boards, and um, it's very striking to me about how you have to really hone in on that piece of it. But you also have to be very sensitive to burnout. Because oh. people burn out, and yeah. you also have to be very sensitive. What I found is donor fatigue, yeah. because uh, a lot of folks we've been, been supporting us for a dozen years, you got to know when to give them a break, and uh, that's why you have to. For us, we always have to keep searching and beating the drum and telling the stories and and finding new audiences. And broaden your base. Broaden our base, and so we're in a growth mode, and that's uh, because we know that uh, it's not sustainable for us to continue to ask the same donor base to continue to give more and more, we have to broaden. And so, but, but knowing that when you hit that fatigue point is really critical because you want people to feel good about being associated with you but not feel it's a burden. I think there's a whole range of charities out there. There's the complete volunteer, no staff, to the fully functioning CEO, foundational element, and a big staff. And along the way, that gradient you might ask yourself, well, how do I build from the 100% volunteer to what do we get one employee, two employee, how do we build out? And, and trying to get through that usually takes a handful of people to say, we're going to bankroll it and make it work. And, and I think that's the first, I think of it always as a stepped element. You're way up here. Well, then it's the question of what's the role of a board, someone on a board, you know, and how the, whether it's corporate or not for profit, you know, how much in the weeds should you really be? And and who's running it and what is the board really, which I think should be very, you know, the role of a board is to make sure you've got the right CEO and to provide the strategy. And then the tactics should be done by the staff. And then not for profit, there's not always the <clears throat> the talent or the ability or the bandwidth to actually execute. So it becomes, I think, the board and the staff, be, that lines easily, can be easily blurred. And, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But I, I think, um, depending upon where the organization is in its maturity level. And at the beginning, board members do everything. And as it becomes a more mature organization, you know, the staff does the execution and the board does the, make sure it's the CEO and motivates and it does a 360 and, comp and all of that, but, uh, and sets the strategy, but, you know, 
don't tell the staff what to do. But, but, in, be but in between on mid-sized organizations, there is a role for board members with specific subject matter expertise to be a resource for the staff. Not Absolute do, resource. But, yeah, right. and, and, and as you put a board together, it's really important to think about what are the different disciplines where you, you would like some professional um, expertise, not to, to do the work, but to, to help oversee and, and to make sure that the right issues are, uh, people are focusing on, staff is focusing on the right issues. I think in more advanced charities, the challenge I have is try, keeping the board out of trying to run the darn thing. Yes. Okay. It's it's not, it's not. And you're just going, wait a minute, what is our role, our charter? Okay. And what is the definition of a board member? Having clarity around those things, all of a sudden you get five cooks in the kitchen and all of a sudden there's only three knives. I look around and I go, there's going to be two problems here. They work on each other instead of working on the cause. And so I think clarity of roles is very important to establish, which is also means when you bring people on, if you ask them, be very upfront about this as you're building a charity or contributing, and be very clear if you're going to be asked to join one. What is my role? These are the things I'm not going to do. Okay, I very clearly have always articulated mine. I'm glad to help manage it, glad to talk about it, but I am not going to be your fundraiser. Okay, I just don't feel comfortable in that strike zone. Okay, now you have clarity of role. But you're all running businesses, it's the same thing. Clarity of role leads to the first step of success, right? What are you responsible for, what are you not? So I'd love to open this up to questions. We have microphones back there. I've got a question. Working? Oh, you could just yell. <laughs> um, for Leonard, uh, let me say I have great admiration for uh, going solo on the ram across the country. I once got invited to join a team of eight and wisely, after reading the rules, hired one of my younger partners to take my position. Uh, <laughs> that, that is a remarkable. What is one out of five who start solo finish? It's extremely, it's an extraordinary thing. My question for you is, you've taken this organization, created it, put it on your back, you are the chief fundraiser, and obviously, um, without your involvement, this is not going to go anywhere. My question is, do you see this as an evergreen organization? And how do you see yourself transitioning this organization to the point where it is self-sustaining, if, that if that's your plan? Uh, you know, that's such a good point, because there's only so many times I can, you know, jump on a bicycle or run a marathon. And, uh, but it really is, uh, after Race Across America, it really was no longer about Len Forkus going out and doing crazy stuff. It was really about creating sustainability and, and finding sponsors, finding supporters, and, and, and recruiting a working board as well. And uh, everyone on our board is, has some functional element. Just like when I ran ULI Washington, everybody on my executive committee did something. Uh, it, would, it was usually in a sweet spot that they were good at. But, uh, but, but I think it's, you know, we, we've, we've become sustainable without doing these things because we've got several events. We also do a, a 200 mile bike ride uh, with a group uh, that raises 50, 60,000. We've got partners, we're filing for grants and so forth. The real key for us is how do, we, how do we get to sustain 500 kids a year? And what we have to do is really focus on finding stakeholders in the markets where we're serving these children because we have a huge density of kids in Denver. Huge, huge number of kids were serving in Atlanta and in, uh, in Tampa and in San Francisco. So there's like six or seven flat, like Memphis, where, uh, where St. Jude is located. So what we need to do, or the next phase for us, is really to find stakeholders, recruit passionate people that have been, have been moved by what we do in those markets to help us begin to propagate it in those places and find their own ways to raise money and, and, and help us recruit more folks. So that's really what we have to do next is propagate. There are great business models out there. Red Cross, for example, is a franchisable type entity that has a brand that it lends itself to local initiatives and groups. It has an organization team and it funds the initial investment and then launches it. And, and so a lot of what Lynn's looking at is, is probably in that type of caliber of creating an evergreen 
but it's usually what I found is the franchise model works best on a geographically dispersed envelope. Accenture did a study for us uh, to look at ways that we could leverage our resources. And then we have two full-time staff members and their recommendation for the third full-time staff member was a, effectively a, uh, a volunteer coordinator. Right now we have over 25 volunteers that provide at least four FTEs. Wow. And so we think we can bring that volunteer base up to 50 to 70 if with the right volunteer coordinator. And so we think a lot of ways to create more, uh, more resources is to, again, recruit more folks to support. A lot of people want to support us and a lot of the work that we do can be outsourced with proper training. So that's our next phase as well, is to continue to have more impact with less cost and, uh, and begin to, to drive that. And again, again, search for partners too. And, and the geographical market, the markets have been a function of um, uh, high capacity children's hospitals that deal with Yeah, we have uh, partners with 60, 60, 70 different children's hospitals yeah. all throughout the country. Yeah. And, uh, and it's, it's growing as more and more kids uh, learn about it. Yes. A question for you who are in the social service uh, type of organization or those in community building. How important is um, elements of diversity beyond the skill set? So bringing millennials onto your board or people of color onto your board and have you found any uh, good techniques to recruit uh, diversity to a board? Well, on the, our community foundation, um, we actually um, made a, are making a concerted effort to bring in millennials. Um, what we found is it's difficult because they don't have the time. Um, they have certainly a talent skill, but they don't have really the bandwidth to, to meet, to go to committee meetings, to, um, I mean, they're working, you know, 60, 70, 80 hour weeks. Um, so we have, when we bring them on, we have to be very specific about what we want them to do. So we bring them on for a skill set. Um, oftentimes it's technology, it's reaching out to that group. Um, but the, one of the frustrations has been um, just they're limited in, in, in what they can do. And on the diversity, that's very important because we represent a very diverse geographic. Uh, the matrix of our board is crazy what we have to it's a skill set, it's a location, um, it's diversity, it's, um, it, it, it's crazy. Well, and we have a board that is, t I mean, that's another question is, we have a 27 person board, which is huge. Um, and a lot of the work's done in committee, um, but to, the staff time it takes to manage 27 people, um, yeah, I think, it, I mean, one of the things we're changing is I think we said something had like 70 committee meetings through the year, and all that takes a huge staff time. So maybe I can address from my experience when I was chairing the Social Services Board. Um, so looking at it from a, you want board members who are not only going to give time but money. Um, sometimes the people who have the time and the money, um, by the time you identify them, they're already committed, they have their pet costs. And, and so the challenge is how do, how do you have a pipeline of, of people who are very, who have a passion about your organization and who can grow into it? So one of the things that I did was I set up what I called a junior board. Um, and it was made up of the 20s and 30 year olds um, who loved to go and have parties and raise money by going out and drinking and that was great. <laughs> and then I came up with the idea of putting their, the head of their junior board on our board um, as a, a voting member. And at first, this young man, he was a Goldman Sachs banker. He was very quiet and very studious. And I said to him, I really, I, I'm interested in what you have to say, please. You know, he's really, really smart. So um, it turned out to be a great way of developing this group of, of folks with affinity. And in fact, he ultimately, subsequently, uh, stepped up and, and succeeded in his chair of the board. Um, he's one of the youngest people to be promoted at Goldman Sachs. So, um, you need to think you need to think creatively about how you you know get those touch points. Uh, as one of five partners in a for-profit company, I was wondering what advice you would have 
in terms of talking to the other partners and setting priorities for the organization in terms of levels of generosity and priorities for giving? Well, I, I think not knowing how big the organization will take the challenge, I, I think the, uh, the way I have thought about it, and I run mine as a partnership, even though I'm a public company, sit down with the guys and say, I don't think we're ever going to agree on this, but the principles of time and money, um, and then you have 1,300 people who have a diversity of interest. So we decided that just giving time and how they wanted to spend it would be the best way given 20 different markets and 200 communities and different passions around each of the team, but try to emphasize that the team at the local level should. So that fit our business model and it was much more easier for us to say, here's how we're going to. I've seen other public companies that Habitat for Humanity is their support and everybody drops and gives that to that charity in time or dollars. Um, I just felt more about it when we talked about it, not knowing the diversity, the individual community level, the comfort level with it. And some of these communities, it's funny, they go down and it's the soup kitchen, others it's the Red Cross, but we've had them reach out to each individual community and try to weigh the choices and actually have charities come in and pitch the group in DC where there's 300 people and saying, what would you like? And then they coalesce. So empower them is my suggestion. And, and time is the first place to start. And then you'll see where it goes. And then after that, money starts coming into the equation and it's a different conversation. Hi. Um, my understanding of uh, philanthropy is uh, pretty much the way that it's been discussed and I appreciate the thoughts, ideas, and, and each of your efforts to, uh, to help out. And it tends to be providing time or money and it occurs to me, uh, in part by an experience that I had on the Tuesday um, uh, housing and transit innovation uh, tour, um, that maybe part of the idea of philanthropy can shift to, are there ways that businesses can um, reduce the need for, th uh, for, for help? And the example that, that, that stuck out at me, uh, for me, was that the pizza place that we had lunch, uh, the, the owner was given an opportunity to talk about uh, things, how the business got set up and, and uh, the philosophy behind it and, and the giving part of it and so forth. And uh, there were pictures given of, uh, shown of young people in this case who were helping out uh, as employees, and they had disability of one sort or another. And so providing the job for the individual was very helpful to the, uh, to the person who probably was a recipient of philanthropy in the, in the general definition of the word, including uh, one that was mentioned as uh, someone who was able to now live on their own and I don't know what, on what basis if they were in a facility that, that was a philanthropy uh, recipient or, or whatever, but I'm just wondering, I, I know it's a flip, but if you could give some uh, observations about ways that, that businesses can provide um, assistance to people such that they don't need philanthropy. Does that make sense? If you give me a card, I'm glad to put you in contact with an interesting group that my, one of my former partners is now contributing greatly too. And actually they've developed a business model where they're going to individual cities and right now they have franchises in Denver and Dallas and uh, they're soon opening up in Austin where they actually are attacking the homeless and they're going to cities and saying, do you realize in, in Dallas, Texas, for example, the annual budget, not just the drain on society is $28 million a year. We think there's a way to solve this problem, not just trying to provide housing, but actually 
repurposing lives and regenerating integration back into society. And then they have a formula, and what they've said is, is we think instead of your 28, we can do it for 21, okay? And actually lining out a program of work to where you see actual business people coming back into these social challenges and arriving at business solutions. And, and so if, if you give me a card, I'll put you in contact with a group that just does that. And, and it's fun to see people who get late in life, I'm gonna say late in life, he's only 65, but establishes a business case that actually is a win-win. I mean, they're not gonna make any money, but the whole point is, is they've applied a business and go to a city and pitch that, and they're winning those city arguments. But it's about repurposing lives. Yeah, it's, the challenge is, is government programs versus bringing a different set of skills and looking at it. I think we have time for one more question. Um, I'm, I'm gonna just bring us back to that diversity question. Um, I serve on the board of a social service agency. It's a domestic violence shelter in Portland that also provides um, empowerment, uh, financial empowerment training, and we serve all facets of the survivor community. So not just women, but we serve um, same-sex partner violence, um, anything of anything you're surviving from in the DV arena. Uh, one of the challenges that we have on our board right now as we're going through a board transition is finding diversity in the candidates who want to join our board because the last thing we want to see happen as a board is a board of 20 women of the same age or all one homogenous group of people. And so we're actively trying to seek candidates in all facets of our community. And so how do you go about reaching out to people regardless of their economic um, status? You know, it's not always about do donating money, it's about donating how you approach the challenge, um, your time and how you approach it. So how do you reach out into your community to get board candidates that are not like you? So um, typically on nonprofit boards, they have what's called the give or get policy. And there is a minimum financial contribution that each board member is expected to either personally give or raise um, uh, from others. And if for there is also there it's also kind of on a needs adjusted basis so if somebody is is a terrific board candidate but doesn't have the capacity to meet the financial contributions but is going to contribute in some other way that's a given importance but i think your question was where i don't know where you went she just said oh, there, i think your question was how do you actually find the people um, and I, at the foundation, it's a lot of it comes from other board members and you say at your board meeting, this is the skill set we're looking for, this is the demographic we're looking for, um, and then go into organizations that maybe your organization touches and look at those board members and to see if there's any cross fertilization that can happen. Um, but recruit, finding and recruiting board members is a very s serious, time intensive, but really critical, deliberate effort. Try this one. Portland's a great community, has a very active Chamber of Commerce. Uh, go to the Chamber of Commerce and ask for a window to present to the Chamber. And inside of that, put up your ask. We're looking for board members. They may not be on the Chamber, but the Chamber is connected to all the business community, okay? And the second is, is go to the uh, churches and many multi-denominations multi, uh, congregate and have their own conference and are willing to take on a ask as well. And, and I think I would start with well-organized, cross-dimensional organizations and put forth your case to them and you will get one or two hands that will be raised that I know someone that can help you or has an interest in helping you. 
but I think that's a practical way, highly leveraged on your time to get, find some interested people. You know, the other thing is using social media. Um, I heard a story of a community foundation that was starting and basically sent out through social media. We're looking, this is our mission, these are our values, we're looking for board members. And you know, you're gonna have to pick through a lot of things, but I, if you put it out there, um, yeah. you know, just get the word out. There is an organization in New York, and unfortunately I don't know the name of it, but it actually gets, has a roster of people who have expressed interest but don't know how to find the right board opportunity. And what they do is try to match those candidates with organizations that are looking for them. And what I've done is like I did at ULI, uh, before we bring somebody to the executive committee, we'd, we'd um, ask them to, uh, to volunteer to run a, run, run, a, run a conference or run an event. Same thing, our youngest board member is a 27-year-old young lady, she's an accountant, and uh, she was the co-chair of our dinner gala as a volunteer. And so there, there you can see them in action and they, they prove themselves, uh, especially for the younger, younger folks. And she was an easy person to, to bring on board because she uh, had the heart and she executed well and we knew she could contribute. She got the message. She worked with all of our other board members. There's a lot of ways too you can uh, you know, task them with a, a really good assignment that they think would be, uh, they have good skills to, to fulfill. So um, I hope this session has motivated you to get out and do more than you're doing today. And um, I don't want to favor anybody's particular cause, but I would encourage everybody to consider supporting Len on his, on his ride. And please um, join me in thanking our panelists.